pet food makers want us to treat Fido and Fifi like members of the family. They say our furry friends get choice cuts of meat, fish, and poultry. But behind the glossy ads, it's a different story. Unfortunately, the pet food industry is not being forthcoming with pet owners. It's more than a quibble with kibble. Are we poisoning our pets? And is there any difference between so-called gourmet pet food and the cheap stuff? I'm Anne-Marie MacDonald. This Doc Zone is a dog's breakfast. From Purina For over 50 years, pet owners have been told to trust pet food. Dogs who appreciate the finer things in life enjoy Purina Dog Chow. So complete, all you add is love. Today, the trust pet food makers so carefully built is being shaken. In spring 2007, the biggest recall in North American pet food history left sick and dead animals and emotionally traumatized owners. You get very close to the cat. It's not anymore uh, an animal, it's a member of your family. The scandal left many owners not knowing what to feed their pets. There's no one to turn to. There was nowhere to go. Now pet owners are wondering, is the food a quality product? Is the industry adequately regulated? Can the industry still be trusted? Critics say no. The recent recall was an accident waiting to happen. And the problem goes on. 18 months from now, we'll have another recall if we don't do something about it. Standards can be lax. Old boots, wood shavings, and motor oil. Add some vitamins and minerals, and this brew could actually meet the minimum standards for dog food. Now, an investigation of this $16 billion industry reveals quite a mess. Looks like pet food has become a dog's breakfast. Every day, pet owners in North America buy millions of bags, cans, or pouches of pet food. It's routine. On March 16, 2007, that all changed. Hi, how can I help you? Do you have an emergency? I do. What's going on? My cat's been vomiting. Menu Foods, a large Canadian pet food manufacturer, announced its products were poisoned and issued a recall. Lisa Moses is an ER doctor in Boston's Angel Animal Medical Center, one of the largest animal hospitals in North America. After the recall was announced, things really did go kind of crazy here. We were flooded with panic-stricken phone calls and visits to our emergency room. Thank you for calling MSBC Angel. Lydia, I'm speaking. How can I help you? Thank you for calling. Our phones were pretty out of control, and people were really inundated with the phone calls. Vomiting. Is there any blood in the vomit? Because of the way the information was being disseminated, there really was kind of a rising tide of panic almost, and it kept building. Millions of people were terrified they were poisoning their pets. Some had been. Hi. Once the recall was announced and we all started thinking about cases that we had seen in the recent past, it started to become clear to us that we had probably been seeing cases for a while. No one knows for sure how many pets got sick or died throughout North America. Some estimate tens of thousands. The specter of all of the dogs and cats that could have been sickened by this threw us into a kind of a grief state here. We were really very distressed about the prospect of seeing so many deaths happen in a short period of time. The diagnoses were identical. Kidney failure. A lot of the horror of this situation was the thought of all of these people whose animals are so dear to them 
being faced with the knowledge that maybe I've been poisoning my beloved pet. That's pretty hard to contemplate. Dr. Elizabeth Hodgkins has been busy since the recall. She travels throughout Canada and the U.S. crusading for widespread change in the pet food industry. Good boy. Come on, Jetson. The menu foods recall of hundreds and hundreds of foods should signal to all of us that there is a systemic problem in the pet food industry. In fact, there is. That problem at its heart is lack of regulation. We have no effective regulation of the pet food industry. The fox is guarding the hen house. There is no other way to put it. Right here is very swollen. So he's got a tumor growing there at the point of his lower jaw. Hodgkins has a vet clinic in Southern California. Oh, I'm sorry, big man. Okay. Before opening her practice, she worked for a large pet food company. After leaving the industry, Hodgkins became one of its most outspoken critics. Eight solid. In April 2007, she testified before a U.S. Senate subcommittee investigating the pet food recall. I speak today not as a previous pet food company employee, but as a veterinarian with a deep concern for the health of dogs and cats everywhere. The present pet food safety crisis is not an unfortunate aberration. Hodgkins claims the industry often produces an inferior product and deceives the public. Unfortunately, the pet food industry is cutting corners, is not doing the testing it says that it's doing, is not using the quality of ingredients it wants pet owners to believe are in that bag and can, and is not being forthcoming with pet owners about those facts. It is not a truthful industry. David and Don Sagan, like millions of other pet food buyers, trusted the pet food industry to deliver a safe and healthy product. Find a bird. Find a bird in there, Zeke. Find it. Don and David's new black lab, Zeke, is a replacement for their old black lab, OJ. Just before Christmas 2006, 10-year-old O.J. suddenly got sick. He'd eat as much as he could because he was starving. And then he'd throw it up, and I started to get angry with him at first because I thought, well, you know, he's just being picky or disobedient. Come on, eat your supper, let's go. They tried changing food. Good boy, finish your supper. I'm buying all these different, but I'd buy one can at a time and try it. But many of the different foods Dawn bought were actually being made by one company, Menu Foods of Toronto. Menu manufactures for major labels and store brands. About one-third of all the wet dog and cat food sold in North America is made by Menu. Back in Illinois, O.J.'s kidneys were shutting down. He wasn't the same dog anymore, and he was crying. He would whimper. So I just couldn't take it anymore, so I talked to Dave. I said, we can't, if they can't fix him, this isn't fair for him to live like this. You know, it isn't any way to live. So we agreed to have him put down. Don put O.J. down in mid-February. Shortly afterward, Menu Foods made a terrible discovery. Their food had been poisoned by melamine, a chemical usually found in plastic. It had made its way into a food ingredient, wheat gluten, from China. Eventually, about a thousand foods sold under 100 different brand names were recalled. The reason there were so many brands and products that were involved in this massive recall, the most massive recall uh, in history of pet food, is a process known as co-packing. 
in which many, many, many large pet food companies and small pet food companies will contract with a single facility that is capable of making canned pet food. This facility, which has no particular brand, makes foods for hundreds of pet food companies. Dawn discovered that several of the different foods she had been feeding OJ were on the recall list. She believes that's what killed him. I felt like a murderer. You know, here I was trying to force my dog, my, you know, my beloved dog, to eat for me so he'd be okay, and that he was poisoned. He was poisoned by their negligence. Coming up next, the industry promotes pet food ingredients people like. But what's actually in the food? I think many pet owners would be very surprised to learn about the ingredients that are actually going into the can or the bag of food that they're feeding to their pet. They would be shocked. Jovana Kovacevic of Toronto fed her two cats food on the recall list. One of them died. Her other cat, Tosha, needs ongoing veterinary care. I think by now the total thing is uh, about $7,000. We'll take the blood sample now from him. Jovana and her boyfriend have gone into debt for their cats. It's a lot of money. People put down payment for their house for that money. And we put it for our cats. I was hiding from people because people would probably think that we are crazy how much money we spend on that. So Peter had to, to take another job, working another job. You don't see each other that much. Jovana is spending whatever it takes. Now she wants that money back. It's not my fault. It's not my boyfriend's fault. So... You want them to pay for their mistakes. Of course you want your anger. Jovana has joined one of 90 class action lawsuits. Pet owners want compensation for vet bills and emotional trauma. You get very close to the cat. It's not anymore uh, an animal, it's a member of your family. The pet food makers have not yet agreed to make payments for emotional damages. And the law may be on their side. Generally, pets have been viewed as just property, and people can't collect emotional damages for the loss of possessions. But Luciana Brazil, a Vancouver class action lawyer, says pets are more like family members, and the companies themselves promote that. If you look at the labels, and if you look at the packaging and the promotional materials, Virtually every one of them appeals to the sense of this is your family member. Is your relationship in its early years or are you old pals? Are you close friends in the great indoors or a family in a full house? Are you living the pure Treat your pets as family is a new message. My prime is delicious. 50 years ago, pet food makers emphasized the convenience of their product. He seems to like Prime, too. Besides being easy to serve, Prime needs no refrigeration. You know a good deal... Companies competed to provide the best-sounding ingredients. Four kinds of meat products. Beef, chicken, and horse meat. In the 60s, advertising emphasized the bond. My little old dog. A heartbeat at my feet. He makes me feel very special. I guess that's what makes him special. Today, pets aren't just special. They're part of the family. The family relationship the industry promotes has helped create a new demographic of pet owners. According to a pet food industry survey, nearly two-thirds of pet owners are childless. About 60% buy their pets Christmas presents. If the class action lawsuits seeking emotional damages succeed, it could be a legal breakthrough. 
pets would be more like children than possessions. They can't, after having done all the publicity and sold their food on the basis that this is your family member, they can't now turn around and when it comes time to have the case determined before the court, say, I shouldn't be held you know, accountable to your pet to that level, it's just property. In my view, they can't do that. Menu Foods, plus five of the top pet food companies and the Pet Food Industry Association, all refused to be interviewed. As animals come to be seen as family members, the industry promotes its products as being a lot like human food. The pet food industry absolutely misleads pet owners when they show us commercials of T-bone steaks and all sorts of wonderful foods that we would gladly eat ourselves. We were talking about how... In a Toronto pet food store, Hodgkins asks customers how they make buying decisions. Look on a label. Let me ask you, this kind of appeals to me because I love blueberries uh -huh. and I hear how good they are from us as humans and I tend to think, well, what's good for us must be good for the animal and potatoes right. are my favorite food. <laughs> right, yes, mine too, I love them. Packaging is a big part of how people make decisions about what to buy for their pets. Unfortunately, they really obscure the real issue and the real issue is what's inside and what kind of nutrition are we getting from it. Most pet owners want the best for their animal family member, but they don't want to go to a lot of trouble and expense. Pet food companies say they provide human-grade food at low cost. Their emphasis on the quality of their ingredients is represented on a website linked to the industry, the Veterinary News Network. The phrase, you are what you eat, has a lot of pet owners concerned about the pet food they're feeding their dogs and cats. Premium pet food companies choose high-quality ingredients that are often considered human-grade. I think many pet owners would be very surprised to learn about the ingredients that are actually going into the can or the bag of food that they're feeding to their pet. They would be shocked. Up next, Dr. Elizabeth Hodgkins goes into the kitchen to reveal the secrets of how pet food is actually made. Pet food makers say their ingredients are human grade. When Dr. Elizabeth Hodgkins worked for a manufacturer, she discovered how the products are actually made. The ingredients that go into pet foods are almost, without exception, salvage from human food production. It's a place to put, that is, pet food is a place to put what would otherwise be discarded waste from human food production. And that can include diseased parts of animals. What does the fish that's in pet food look like? Well, it really doesn't look like salmon filet. It looks a lot more like the relatively non-nutritious parts of the head ending up in the pet food pile with, of course, the really good salmon meat being reserved for human consumption. By far, the majority of chicken that makes it into pet foods is poultry byproducts. And that's not this part of the chicken, even though that's what you see in the advertisements and on the labels. It's this part, the head, beak, also the feet of the chicken. Once this mixture is cooked for a while, it's really becoming very processed. So all pet food manufacturers will add a vitamin mineral supplement at this point in the processing and it'll look very much like this. It's sort of like a powdered one-a-day vitamin. And then, in the commercial processing plant, the food is then put into cans, cans we're all familiar with. 
Pet food ingredients may not be what humans want to eat, but the industry insists pets are living longer, healthier lives because of their products. Most veterinarians agree, commercial pet food is an adequate product. Dr. Rebecca Remillard is a small animal nutritionist. She feeds her own pets kibble. I think the average commercial pet food product out there is, is a nutritious product. Remillard relies on the reputation of pet food makers. A leading brand supplies her hospital with veterinary diets and she trusts companies that make diets like this. I have decided that the best thing for me to do is to go to the reputation and operations, if you will, the policies and procedures of the companies themselves. It's based on uh, trust and trust that was built on communication and in evidence. Marlene, can you put them on the scale for me? Good boy. Step up here. Dr. Remillard gives nutritional advice at Angel Animal Medical Center, one of North America's biggest animal hospitals. So he weighs about 63 pounds? Wow. Between 62 and 64, he okay. weighs 63. So he's been about this Although Remillard believes commercial food is an adequate product, she says that in many cases, pet food marketing is misleading. Some companies, I believe, probably most companies, unfortunately, marketing overrules science. The science is, is, is at, at one level, the marketing overstretches that. Come on, Lou. <laughs> Your dog's one of a kind. An example, a recent Purina commercial that says its products let dogs live two years longer. A groundbreaking 14-year study by Purina proves that puppy chow, then dog chow nutrition fed properly over a lifetime can help extend median lifespan by 1.8 laughable, lovable years. In this longevity study, all dogs were fed only Purina Chow. No other product was tested. One group of dogs got more food, another group got less. Dogs that got less lived longer. The point of the study is that if you fed less, roughly 25% less, your dog will be leaner, and a, a leaner dog will live longer than a fat dog. Um, you probably could get that done with anybody's dog food if you fed less. It's unethical to make a claim that a food does something good, when in fact there's no evidence that it does good. Critics say the industry makes scientifically unfounded health claims. Some scientists say better research would require animal experiments, but that makes many consumers uneasy. This video, shot by an animal rights group, shows a facility that conducted experiments for a major brand. No one supports cruelty, but many scientists say moderately invasive experiments are the best way to create a better product. For pet owners, this poses a major ethical dilemma. Can damaging a few animals to help many others be justified? There isn't any need to do animal testing to come up with good quality animal foods. For example, if we want to know how best to nourish a cat, we look at what cats have been eating for millennia, small mammals, birds. We can instantly understand without subjecting a single animal to any invasive or confining testing what we should be feeding cats. Puppies are like babies. They need love and extra nutrition to grow up healthy and happy. Trouble is... Before animals became family members, making pet food seemed simple. What to do with dog food? Beef. Beef liver, lamb, chicken, eggs. As dog dietitians always say, all beef and no chicken makes Jack a dull dog. 
Gus thinks it's his job to protect me from the But world. promoting basic ingredients isn't enough anymore. A love like this deserves new I Am Small and Toy. It's concentrated nutrition with more... The industry is now marketing ever more expensive food to ever smaller niches. It's customized to meet the demands of the performance sporting dog. He can hardly get Move into around. it get into the cat box with his hind legs. Dr. Elizabeth Hodgkins believes that these nutrition claims made by pet food makers cannot be justified. Pet foods should not be entitled to carry claims that are not scientifically validated. Those kinds of claims lead the pet food purchaser to believe that they're buying better quality, safer, more complete and balanced foods than they can possibly be able to buy. A common ploy in pet food marketing is the claim that a food is premium. It implies quality and commands a higher price. Okay. Dr. Marion Smart, an animal nutritionist, claims premium foods aren't worth the extra money. People are paying more money thinking that they're getting a better quality food and there's marginal differences between the qualities of the food. It's just a marketing strategy from, by the companies. I'm giving you a little quiz. It's not going to be held against you, you're not going to be marked on it, but we're going to find out just how much you know about the pet food industry. The first one is... Smart challenges her senior year students at the Western College of Veterinary Medicine in Saskatoon to identify premium and non-premium foods by looking at information on the labels. The grocery brand diets are what you'd buy in Safeway. The premium diets are what you'd buy in a pet specialty store. And the grocery brand diets... It's a tough task because the information on premium and non-premium labels looks the same. <laughs> Smart has found that her students can't tell the difference between premium and non-premium foods. She believes that's because there is no significant difference. Diet. How many said premium? How many said grocery brand? So virtually, if you look at these, they're not too far apart in formulation. Chances are, if they're made by the same company, they're not going to have five bins of different quality protein, by poultry byproduct meals, so they're going to have one bin of the same quality. To test Smart's claim that premium pet food buyers are paying extra money for little reason, samples of premium and non-premium cat and dog food are taken to a feed testing lab. The food is tested for the main nutrients, protein, fat, and fiber. The conclusion? There's no significant difference in nutrients between premium and non-premium food. Higher priced foods may have greater digestibility, but the word premium does not mean high quality. I think it's deceptive to the consumer because we've got products out there that are vastly different in price and rather similar in formulation. Very often when you get into your practice, you're going to be asked, what's the best diet for my dog? And but how well qualified are vets to answer this question? Veterinarians themselves have had limited training in nutrition and so they're basically the training they get is from the companies themselves and what the companies are telling them the products are doing for them. Soon these students will be giving nutrition information to consumers and Smart worries about that. There is a gap between what the consumer thinks the veterinarian knows and what the veterinarian actually knows. Marketing is the, the thing that drives the engine. Up next, what should pet owners be feeding their animals? Some consumers are shocked. So you've just eliminated everything I've fed my cats for 20 or 30 years. Concern over pet food marketing techniques is growing. Now, it even extends to the order in which the ingredients are listed on the label. Critics accuse the industry of deception in hiding the true makeup of its products. We see a very interesting trick that pet food companies will make on their ingredient listing, and that's called ingredient splitting. 
Ingredient splitting gives consumers the impression that they're getting more expensive meat and less cheap grain. By regulation, ingredients must be listed on the label by weight. Meat is more desirable than grain, so pet food makers want to list it first. There's actually more grain than meat in most dry foods, but food makers don't want it to appear that way. This recipe has three types of corn. Corn meal, corn gluten meal, and corn grits. Separately, each weighs less than the meat, but when all the corn is added together, it totals more than the meat. Corn meal, corn grits. Hodgkin says all that grain is particularly bad for cats. Cats have to eat meat to get the essential nutrients that they need. So their diet cannot be based in grain. I fed them grain forever. Well, cats. Cats don't do well with grain. Ah, uh, I can't believe what you just told yeah. me. Yeah, no cat should be fed dry cat food. The cat is an obligatory carnivore. Carnivores can eat some grain, but Hodgkins claims grain-based dry food is overprocessed. Everything that is used in the batter that becomes dry dog and cat food is pre-processed, processed again. We lose a tremendous amount of the quality of the nutrients in this batter throughout that process. The grains in food are made more digestible by processing, but it destroys a lot of the nutrients. And we're going to make little kibbles here. I liken commercial pet foods to convenience foods for ourselves. Hodgkins claims that feeding animals a consistent diet of commercial food is worse than feeding children nothing but pizza. Although pizza, particularly if you varied the toppings on the pizza, would represent fresher, more wholesome, natural ingredients because pizza is typically not nearly as processed as the canned and bagged pet food that we feed our pets. The final step in the preparation of dry cat and dog food is to spray rendered fat on the outside of the kibble. This increases the palatability of the kibble substantially and also increases the caloric content. So how do you choose a food for Waldo among all of these choices? Well, what I do is I ask for some samples and I put a few on the floor and I see which one he will eat. Hey, Waldo, we'll buy that for you. Come on. The problem with that kind of a taste test for Waldo is that pet food companies compete with each other on the basis of palatability. In essence, it's sort of like when tobacco was being amped with extra nicotine to make one cigarette brand more popular over another. Um, Waldo is responding more to an amped palatability enhancer in a food that he might like the best. His preferences are not a good indicator of what's going to be best nutrition for him long term. Hodgkins feeds her own pets a raw food diet. It's high quality, but expensive and less convenient. The industry says the extra time and money isn't worth it because its food is carefully designed to meet the specific nutritional needs of pets. Home-cooked meals and even some prepared organic foods are not complete and balanced, which can lead to serious health problems. The industry also warns home cooking can be dangerous. Owners have to be aware of possible bacterial contamination and other problems when cooking their own pet food at home. For consumers worried about what they need to feed their animals, there is no simple answer. Many have lost trust and are seeking alternatives. Even a mix of kibble and table scraps is better than kibble alone, according to Hodgkins. Pet owners should not be feeding one food, one form of food, or one brand, or exclusively commercial food, over the entire life of their pet. In fact, vary the type of food and certainly add fresh whole ingredients, in the case of cats, meat to the diet. 
So you've just eliminated everything I've fed my cats for 20 or 30 years because it's basically been dry cat food. All experts advise that an informed consumer has a better chance of making an informed choice. When we return, believe it or not, a strange brew made from old work boots can meet pet food standards. Dr. Marion Smart of the Western Veterinary College cooks up a strange brew. Add vitamins and minerals, and this goop could be good enough to satisfy some basic nutritional standards. This is very important to know what the ingredients are in the pet food, and that's on the ingredient list. Pet food labels are required to list the key nutrient values, like protein, fat, and fiber. But it turns out those standards could be met by inedible ingredients. Old leather work boots can be a source of protein. Our quality control measures dictates that we remove these boots because of lead paint and replace them with these fine mismatched pair of boots. Now we need fiber. Wood shavings. The next essential ingredient is fat. Crankcase oil can fool a nutrient test and appear as fat. The ingredients of this diet are totally indigestible and so it's very important for you to look at the ingredient list to determine whether the ingredients are appropriate for a dog food. After being boiled down, this mixture is sent off to a lab for a nutrient analysis. It's a poisonous mixture no one could actually sell, but Dr. Smart's Old Boots Pet Food can meet standards for protein, fat, and fiber. The industry says their products are strictly regulated, mainly by the Federal Drug Administration. But critics say the rules have been essentially written by the industry itself, and that in any case, they are not enforced. I would love to see the government do a better job of regulating pet foods. I asked for the federal government to make some changes, to disallow label claims that were not scientifically valid, and to make some changes in the regulatory scheme that currently exists. Changes in U.S. regulations would apply to Canada, too. Most foods sold here are American brands, covered by American regulations. Canada follows along. Critics want to force the industry to be honest about what's in the food, to back up its scientific claims, and to take more steps to ensure food safety. Mike Floyd from Austin, Texas is a flooring contractor. He never imagined he'd become a consumer activist. Come here, Ralph. Come here. After Ralph ate recalled food, his kidneys were damaged. Mike went after the pet food industry. Good boy. He can come what I started looking at after I got past the original anger was how to fix things. I've, I've always been sort of a solutions type person and I want to make sure this doesn't happen again. Mike's solution? Change pet food regulations. Mike's website includes a memorial to pets who've passed on. And it turns out thousands of dead animals may have big political power. Defend Our Pets is a pet food consumer group Mike started. He's urging U.S. lawmakers to change food labeling rules. The goal really is to make pet food safe. 
Our pets can't speak for themselves, so we have to. They can't defend themselves. That's our job. We do it by having labels that are meaningful and accurate, and we do it by having some certification on foreign imports that they can't just ship anything they feel like shipping and have it come through virtually uninspected. Good boy. Come on. In May 2007, Mike's efforts resulted in Congress passing a law requiring the identification of foreign ingredients. More labeling legislation is planned. I think there is a call for and a need for the pet food industry to reestablish that trust uh, that we innocently used to have implicitly. It will be a tough fight. The industry says it is already highly regulated. But the menu foods recall is unleashing consumers determined to bring the industry to heel. Nobody even calls you for many foods to, to, to even apologize, to say, I, we are sorry for what happened. Jovana's vet bill is $7,000 and climbing. Tosha will be on a medicinal diet for the rest of his life. Jovana's come to the vets because her cat is still sick. His blood test results are ready. Okay, here are the results. The results and they're not that bad, actually. Oh, but there is a little warning that the yeah. kidneys aren't really perfect and they're coping, but just, just barely. Are you hungry? Jovana is committed to spending what it takes to keep Tosha alive. Okay. I can't abandon them for this and say, like, oh, I'm not going to take care of them. It's not my problem. I mean, it, it is my problem. I'm my cat. But yes, I'm very angry. I don't care if I see a dime from this lawsuit. is isn't about money. I, I want them to change the law. Let our pets be safe. So we can, we don't have to worry. information about any Dog Zone title, click cbc.ca/docs.